In this video, it's roughly six years after the sexual abuse under the influence of MDMA by Peter Sandhill, a Hive facilitator, followed by the cover-up uh, and burial of the issue by all of the Human Awareness Institute facilitators going to the extent of actually cutting me off of the email lists so that it would be difficult for me to communicate what had happened to ask for help, et cetera, et cetera. And to this date, the Human Awareness Institute as a body and as individual facilitators, actually with the exception of Peter Sandel, and I think a, a partial apology by Sarah Sandhill, have not apologized for an, the, the entire kind of hundred or so missteps, a misstep in this case being something that's uh, a gap between a best practice and what actually occurs. And you have a certain amount of mispractice, ethical responsibility. Anytime somebody gives you money to, which is always done in the, in, on the basis, on the promise that your life has a high probability of being improved. Whether you hire a plumber, a therapist, a masseuse, an electrician, you're not hiring someone because you believe they'll burn down your house, electrocute you, flood the basement, you know, give you PTSD, confuse you for life. No, you're, you're hiring a professional under the belief, usually based on a representation by the professionals, that uh, good things will happen. We have your interest at heart. We've bothered to learn about the field enough to know what we're doing. And we are going to uh, present that information. Uh, we're going to provide that service for your benefit. And as a result, you can expect good things rather than disasters to occur. And so it's you know, a, a big deal to experience the worst traumas, the largest increase in pain and shock, and the biggest disability as a result of hiring professionals to improve one's life. Uh, it's now in the fall of 2022, and I wanted to give this update as, you know, just a little bit of check-in for me and uh, for anyone who's wondering, why are these videos here? Why were they created? And why are they still there, right? So uh, at the time that I created these videos, uh, they had a couple of purposes. One of is the phenomena of re-traumatization through articulation of the trauma. Now, when the Human Awareness Institute facilitators voted to disconnect me from the email groups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there was no easy ability to communicate and include other people in the community about where I was. And the consequence, one of the consequences of that, was that any time I would meet someone or encounter someone uh, around the Human Awareness Institute, which was my primary uh, community for love and belonging at the time, uh, they'd say, hey, how are you doing? What's up? And it's like, you know, there's a three-hour narrative 
that answers that question. And I don't want to go into that again every time and re-traumatize. And you don't know how to deal with it, which is one of the side effects of a traumatically illiterate culture, is the average person is not given the tools to understand the ethics or the best practices of responding to someone in a traumatic state. So the effect is, you know, often this incompetence on the in part of the entire culture is covered with a don't ask, don't tell protocol. You say, how are you? I think about, you know, I, I don't want to go into three hours of this, so I say I'm fine. And there's a willful ignorance, right? I'm hiding the single biggest patterns of my life, and you're grateful that you don't have to deal with it, that you're not confronted by your conformity to traumatic illiteracy, right? Oh, good, you're not going to talk about anything that's really upsetting or that I have to think about or that gives me any responsibility. I'll just, you know, because this has nothing to do with me, right? And, and that's, of course, the core defense pattern. In a sick cult or a sick culture, the core defense is that every single person in the pattern, save maybe one or two, is generating plausible deniability and dissociation. That has nothing to do with me that I live in a, in a, in a cult where most people are traumatized and most people don't know how to deal with the trauma and the cult is suffering chronically from the vast mental financial, emotional, and physiological cost of an untreated disease. Right. We're, we're competent enough to cause the disease, but we're not competent enough to heal it or to provide adequate support for people who have caught the disease. We're just competent enough to avoid dealing with it. And thus the phenomena of scapegoating. Uh, it turns out that the phenomena of scapegoating comes from a not very creative tribe in the desert thousands of years ago that when they didn't know how to solve their problems, when they lacked the competency to change a painful dynamic, they all agreed that they would select a random goat, blame the goat, stone the goat, and curse it and send it out into the desert, right? With the, the superstitious hope that this would solve their problems, right? That eliminating one of their food sources, brutalizing a goat, blaming an innocent, would somehow magically lift the stupidity that causes the problems that all groups have to deal with. And of course it doesn't work, and so then the obvious intelligent solution, right, since the first time it doesn't work, is you then pick another goat and stone it and curse it and get rid of more of your food indefinitely, right? That becomes the new protocol. The problem gets too big to deal with, too much upset, okay, time to choose a goat, right? And the cult has evolved since that time to a slightly higher level of intelligence. We don't stone and blame goats any longer. What we do is we ask who is to blame, and the very fact that it's singular 
Right? This is the goal. The goal is to isolate an entire ecological problem in one person. Right? So the question, that's obviously incorrect. Right? You can't solve ecological problems by changing only one variable. There has to be an ecological change. Right. You have to look at things like, well, what about the generation before? Who taught that? Or what about the fact that everyone is blocking the other avenues of this coming to light or being dealt with? Or everyone is systematically participating in chronic emotional illiteracy, chronic traumatic literacy. How are you participating? Well, have you checked if anyone in your circle is competent to deal with one of the most common diseases of the day, trauma, complex PTSD, PTSD? No, you haven't, right? That's participation in chronic intergenerational disease, right? When that is the disease and it's all around us and it's causing tremendous harm, not doing anything about it, not becoming trauma, is participation. But that takes a lot of work, right? I've spent roughly a thousand hours since the moment a stranger in a cafe revealed the blind spot of all of my therapists and became the first person to point me to Peter Levine's book, Healing Trauma, and subsequently the best book I found, which is the body keeps the score to understand the landscape of trauma and our chronic cultural complicity in burying the data, right? Because as stupid, as incompetent, as insane, as stoning a goat is, as ineffective, as ridiculous as finding one person in a complex dynamic of trauma and abuse and shaming them out of the circle, casting them out with judgments, perhaps jail terms, etc., etc., so that the rest of the group can continue chronic ignorance, illiteracy, psychological illiteracy, traumatic illiteracy, biological illiteracy, therapeutic illiteracy. None of my therapists wanted to do somatic work. That's incompetent in the area of trauma, right? But they don't know, and they don't know that they don't know. And their clients don't know and don't know that they don't know. And so they're all waiting around for a mysterious stranger in a cafe to show up to fix the blind spot. And sometimes that doesn't happen, right? So we're, we're dealing with you know, massive amounts of chronic and unnecessary suffering. I've been in more fear and pain and tension ever since I had language, then sustainable well-being. Right. Chronic fatigue, depression, suicidal levels of pain, frustration, anxiety, terror, biological sensations, freezing, right? And $150,000 in therapy never touched it. You know, raw food didn't heal it, crystals didn't heal it, channeled entities didn't heal it, travel didn't heal it, money didn't heal it, right? So that's a pretty big fail, right? And most people don't even have the freedom and the money to waste on so much failure, right? They, they don't have time for a therapist, they don't have time to study raw food diets and do yoga and do this. But even if they did, 
those are not effective responses to PTSD. And the people blindly giving advice for any number of treatments as a panacea, right? They don't know what they're talking about, but unfortunately they don't know that they don't know what they're talking about. So Peter Sandhill has become, I think, partly along with Sarah Sandhill, a little bit of the scapegoat, right? Because when I kept pushing this, that's when they left high, right? And this is what all faulty systems do if they don't have the intelligence to evolve. Right. Because in a competent and responsible dynamic, everyone owns their part. The community owns that, hey, maybe we're focused a little bit too much on kink and sex and polyamory and we need to actually lay foundations and become traumatically literate. And it's my job to read a few books. That's my part. And maybe the Human Awareness Institute facilitators should tell people up front that they're not licensed, that they're good at this, that they're not good at that, that highly traumatized people are not good candidates for the high workshop, and here's why. That these are the risks, that these are good resources, that this is what to do. And we want to gather data about trauma and sexual abuse in our community and publish it and all learn together. And maybe the board of directors, rather than trying to please their figurative parents, would actually learn a little bit about the law rather than just signing off on their name as board of directors. Right. Maybe take the law a little bit more seriously, take the ethics of a nonprofit a little bit more seriously, and make a focus on first doing no harm in a therapeutic relationship, the Hippocratic Oath, right? And maybe the public could hold them a little bit more accountable and actually give a damn when it's not them. In other words, learn the art of empathy. Rather than say, well, it's not my problem. That's sociopathic, by the way. Uh, it, it is my problem if it is in the community, right? And maybe a best practice could be written, right? So none of this has happened. And so, when I began making these videos, I did not know if I would live, right? That was up in the air and, you know, it's, that's somewhat stabilized today. Meaning after hundreds of thousands of dollars of impairment and costs and massive amounts of pain and exploration and terror, et cetera, and, and, and helplessness, I now pretty much know how to stay alive with this disease. So that's, that's, that's new, and that, that takes away a burden of, of, of terror and uncertainty, right? So I'm 30% out of my body. My body is in 40% more shock, more numbness, more pain a lot of the time. My sleep pattern is disrupted. I now go to sleep at 4 a.m. and wake up at 1 p.m. But, you know, I figured out how to work with all that. I can set my appointments in the afternoon um, and just lose business and, and opportunity when that doesn't fit, right? Several friends recently, they're only available in the morning. Well, I'm sorry, I can't be your friend, right? That's, you know, courtesy of this way of managing stimulation, pain, depression, etc. right? So I now know how to deal with this, number one. And with that, and also with purpose, right? Because one of the problems that having 500% more pain than well-being brings about, and then the brain amplifies that to feel a lot louder, but 
when you're in a lot more pain than well-being. The question, why live? You know, this is the suicidal equation. You know, if the rest of my life indefinitely is going to be vastly more pain than well-being, why do it? Right? Other people don't enjoy being around that kind of pain. I don't enjoy being around that kind of pain. And I'm in that kind of pain. In a world that is competent enough to give it to me, but not competent enough to heal it or take it back. Right? So why live, right? Well, Viktor Frankl says that you can endure any what, any amount of misery if you have an important enough why. You know, when you ask Elon Musk, why does he work 100-hour weeks? Why does he pour hundreds of millions of dollars into businesses that every one of his friends and the business world says are going to fail? An individual kid is going to go to space, start a space company that many countries don't even have that ability. What a joke. Every car company since Ford has gone bankrupt. No successes in electric cars. Solar businesses going right, you know, out of business right and left. Right? You're going to change the banking industry. What a joke, right? Bore tunnels. Synthesize and transmit thoughts through Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. It's crazy. Right? And he ad admits it. Highly likely to fail. But when you've been beaten to death repeatedly, when you've been humiliated, when you've been dissociated from your feelings, when you've lost your childhood, when you've watched your mother being brutalized, an island prostitutes, a few hundred million isn't going to cut it. It doesn't answer that level of pain. Right? So if you ask Elon or take the time to read the brilliant Ashley Vance biography, why does he do it? He doesn't need the money. He works harder than I do, than you do, than almost anyone. Why does he work those 100-hour weeks in so much pain, right? Because he wants to believe in a better future for humanity. And that future wasn't happening without Elon. He kept dreaming about space and watching the possibility field shrink. He kept dreaming about electric cars and listening to the bullshit as GM destroyed the EV1 and told the world that nobody wanted them. Right. So changing the world, making it a safer, a more beautiful, a truer place is a reason that's big enough to endure that amount of pain. Well, I'm hunting around for my reason. There's no point in being in this amount of pain just to be in this amount of pain. To have sex, to make a few dollars, to live in a mansion. I mean, it's, it's pathetic as an antidote to this amount of pain. Right? But there are reasons. There are probabilities and possibilities worth living for. Right? So it turns out that the Human Awareness Institute has a chronic history of covering up sexual abuse by its team, by its facilitators. Right? And every one of those people is lied to. Don't go to the police. Don't. This has never happened before. Right? 
and they're given the burden of the facilitator's incompetence. Don't ruin our beautiful organization for just for you, right? Just for you. Just let it go. Team members with PTSD for decades. Participants. Right? It's never happened before. A trauma therapist who can no longer heal abused children is told. After this all happened with me, right? So what's the antidote? to ignorance, lies, and secrecy. Well, data and publicity. So this is an antidote, right? And at one point, it was a dream of mine that this event could lead to an alchemy, a transformation in a very positive sense for all concerned. But that actually requires participation of all concerned, which was not forthcoming, right? You know, I cannot do anything about that, but I can provide some solace, some sanity for victims who are lied to and find themselves in the worst pain of their life because they trusted an incompetent professional to provide a service that is predisposed to trauma and PTSD. Right? Poor practices statistically set people up for trauma and PTSD. <clears throat> and, and high does both, which makes it a gray area, but also more dangerous. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is the brilliance and the talent that the facilitators and that high brings to certain arenas within this work is so outstanding that it's very easy for people who are ignorant and ignorant of their ignorance, such as myself, to generalize the grandiosity of things like the high mission statement. You know, we're committed to creating a world where everyone wins. I mean, that pretty much covers it, right? That would include becoming competent enough. That would include measuring who's winning and losing. That would include responding if somebody is losing in the community and it's a client, et cetera. But you know, so, so rather than isolating its competency very narrowly, high over promised in a very grandiose way, we love helping people. We're good at helping people. We're committed to helping the entire world win. Just not enough to stop our sexual abuse, just not enough to disclose that we're not licensed as therapists, just not enough to find out how our work is helping with documented feedback. Just not enough to have a questionnaire before providing our service that would help isolate people we could actually harm, right? Because it's one thing to say, hey, I teach swimming lessons. But if you can't notice that someone is infected and you're invited them, inviting them to go into water thick with bacteria that a healthy person could swim in, but they're going to die in, you're not a competent swimming coach, right? And so you've got to know enough about what's out there outside of your typical little you know, niche in order to help people make good decisions that are loving for them. Right? And Hyde didn't do that for me. Not Anne, not Peter, not a single facilitator. They all promoted themselves very grandiosely. We love helping. We're good at helping. We're completely committed to everyone winning. And we're happy to take the money for the service. So, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> you know, at one point, this work provided a reason to keep going through enormous levels of pain, right? So that's self-preservation. There's also, you know, it's a very depressing field. If you read The Body Keeps the Score and understand the intense cult commitment to silence and secrecy and shame around trauma and PTSD, 
you particularly think about our military veterans coming home from war and being shamed because the cult doesn't know what it's doing. And if it does, it doesn't care enough about itself or its people to heal its veterans. It's pretty sad. There's a lot of childhood abuse going on right now from veterans with PTSD who are ashamed of their abuse and do not have the capacity to heal it, right? And that's another kind of useful then reason is the more I understood the incompetence of the Human Awareness Institute in this area, the more I understood the incompetence of my parents in their area, the more I understood the incompetence of the US government in its area, right? And so another reason to create material in a world where there's a vacuum, meaning there are tens of thousands of people in and around high at team level, you know, the, nobody that I know wants to talk about this in depth. And the lack of talking leads to a lack of thinking. The lack of thinking leads to a lack of awareness. You cannot have awareness without language. Language is what focuses awareness. And so then the next purpose of this project, you know, when I was making these videos, is to become aware enough of the pattern so as not to repeat it. Because that didn't happen in childhood. When my parents gave me complex PTSD and traumatized me and shamed me and buried it, and then made me feel guilty and manipulated me into hiding it. And when my Waldorf teacher did the same thing, my godmother, my kindergarten teacher, none of this came out, right? I did not see that pattern. Right. Now that means that statistically you haven't either. Right. No therapist helped that pattern come to light. So how do I avoid repeating it? Well, making a bunch of videos that flood information into these dark areas, these areas of willful blindness, willful ignorance and criminal negligence, this provides a possibility to see the pattern enough so as not to repeat it, right? So that becomes another reason. A third reason in that same kind of arena is understanding that, you know, I can dissociate from my parents, I have. I can dissociate from high, I have. But I can't dissociate from life entirely. I've thought about it. I felt like it. But I can't live on this planet, let's put it that way, and stop this pattern all around the world, wherever I go, if I don't understand it. And I can't understand it in a vacuum of secrecy and a fog of lies. <clears throat> and so, you know, an important reason then becomes to to talk about it enough to get it, and to get it enough so that I don't participate in it more. Now, that is partly successful and partly failing. What I mean by that is all human states are viral in nature. PTSD is a virus. People with PTSD are more likely to give other people PTSD. People with a cold are more likely to give other people a cold than people without a cold. People who are happy are more likely to give other people happiness, etc., etc. Human states are viral. So I am giving more fear, more stress, more anxiety, more overwhelm to people around me than if I didn't have PTSD, right? But I'm relative I'm I'm not catching more PTSD for the most part. 
right? That didn't happen with Peter Sandhill. I caught Peter Sandhill's trauma, and then I caught the entire facilitator body's trauma, their paranoia and their fear. They gave it to me rather than help me out of Peter's terror and ignorance and trauma. You know, so they gave me all their pet fears about losing high and all that to carry, and all the bullshit around that, all the insanity. So that also has a big impact, right? When you're in a childlike state, which happened again due to the regression of you know, the use of psychedelics and in a therapeutic setting. It was a profound abuse of power. So that takes some layering to, to get off, right? And so that's still happening. And you can look at my channel, Understand Trauma, uh, to look at, you know, again, when it became clear that there was more resistance within high than commitment to deal with this. There was more commitment to secrecy than to healing, to understanding, to intimacy, to intimacy you see, right? There's actually a commitment to hiding. Well, <clears throat> then my focus shift, okay, I can't live in this amount of pain in the hope that people that don't want to deal with this deal with this. But what about the rest of the world who haven't found their stranger in a cafe to correct their therapist's incompetence, right? What if they stumble across a video and I am the stranger in the cafe that helps them grasp that their therapist isn't helping them in this area, right? So that becomes then a purpose. But it's not enough, right? It's not enough. And so, you know, I started a nonprofit uh, and, you know, exploring this thing. And also, you know, when I realized that I'm not recovering in this cult, the cult offers a social ecology that does not heal trauma naturally, it does not heal PTSD, it actually shames it, right? So then the question is, okay, what would actually heal that? That's a quest, that's a question. And, you know, uh, so I'm on that right now, so I'm not doing much work in this, you know, in this channel, but I did want to give an update. Uh, and so, you know, another key thing, when I thought it's very possible I might die, and I certainly knew that I was in more pain than I had ever felt in my adult life, and it was costing me hundreds of thousands of dollars to cope with that pain in a variety of ways, having lost a lot of trust in therapists who had actually made the situation worse. Well, uh, you know, that produced a tremendous amount of hurt, pain, betrayal, helplessness, and terror. That's, by the way, the recipe for hate. You know, it's, it's, it's incredibly incompetent to tell people don't hate or to lecture people about hate. If you put anyone in massive amounts of pain in a helpless state, and the people around them that they trust and need support from throw them onto, you know, throw them underground to protect their own reputations and, and do a facade and pretend it's not happening. You will produce hate. It's a good recipe, by the way. Helplessness, betrayal, lies, deceit, etc., lack of integrity, and tremendous pain and a timeless state where you don't know if and when you'll ever get out of the pain. That will produce hate in almost any biological being, whether it's a dog, right? Beat your dog, betray your dog. When it comes to you, hit it, right? Your dog will hate you and it's healthy, right? It's a defense against cruelty, sociopathic behavior. So, you know, at, at one point, 
I thought, you know, if I am going to die, and perhaps other people have already died, there have been suicides and deaths within high, uh, I'd like my death to cause a stir. I'd like some of the pain that I'm feeling to transfer to the sociopathic people because when you're empathic and you're dealing with competent people, all you have to say is, I'm in a tremendous amount of pain, I need help like this, please help me, and they will do it, right? Because that's competence and it's empathy. How, who's in the most pain, how can we help the empathic brain? But a reptile or someone functioning from their reptilian brain is not saying, who's in the most pain, how can I help? They're saying, how can I do what's best for me at the expense of the group and minimize my energy expenditure to get more or to avoid loss? And yes, I, I mean, I see that you're sacrificing. I'd like to take you. It's just that would cost me something in reputation and something. And so I'm not going to do it because it's not good for me. Now, someone in a sociopathic, narcissistic state, the only way to motivate them if they're in the reptilian brain is fear. Of what? Of pain. So if the facilitators are hiding information, lying, covering stuff up, disconnecting, because they're afraid of the pain of exposure. Well, they're in a reptilian state of survival. And a reptile doesn't change that state out of empathy. They only change it out of fear. That's why you will find a criminal who will run and shoot you and stuff like that beg when there's no other choice, right? They'll beg when there's no other choice. They'll shoot, they'll kill, they'll steal things, they'll run through things, because they're focused on their survival. But when they're surrounded with people with guns pointing at them, that's the point they say, I'm sorry, I never meant to do it. Because now they will do anything to not have the pain of going to jail, right? So when I understood that the facilitators were largely in a reptilian state, that the core dynamic here was we've got to look out for our jobs, and if we have to throw Dane under the bridge in order to do that, right? because this isn't going to play well in public, so we better shush this up rather than get our act together. It's telling me they are in a reptilian state. And the only way to shift reptiles is by increasing more fear. Right? That's why the police exist. Because criminals are generally, not, not unfortunately in our world where you know, smoking marijuana is, you know, that's, that, that's another issue. But generally, people, criminals who are stealing when they could be working, who are raping people when they could be earning trust and having lovers, you know, they're in a reptilian state. And so when you ask a reptile, could you please stop raping me? They're like, no, I feel like it. Why should I stop? Right? That's the reptilian attitude. You have nothing to stop me. Why should I be afraid of you? I don't fear you. So I will keep abusing you because it's expedient, says the reptilian brain. But if you introduce fear of the consequences of behaving like a reptile, like as soon as the police come out with the gun, See, now the reptile says, oh my gosh, there is a reason not to rape you. Not because you're important, but because I don't want to be shot. Because I don't want to spend the next 10 years in jail just to have a little sex with a rape victim. So, But you're not healing the reptilian state. You're just manipulating the reptilian state with fear, right? I am a sociopath. I'm in a sociopathic state. I will do all these things because it's expedient for me. But if I'm going to go to jail, or if I'm going to be fined, or if I'm going to lose business, 
maybe I won't, right? And so it was a very sad thing to grasp, but understanding that you do not cut off email support from someone in a traumatic state because your colleagues have sexually abused them that you trained and recommended. That's reptilian. And you don't do that if you're not in a reptilian state. And reptiles require fear. Now, this was one of the more painful and devastating things to realize. Right? I realized that with my parents, in order to survive, I needed to manipulate them. It's incredibly lonely and painful to have to become good at manipulating. That's reptilian, right? And reptiles demand reptiles, unfortunately, right? Sociopaths do not listen. Crocodiles don't say, oh, the little five-year-old will eat the parent instead. Let him have his whole life is ahead of him, right? Crocodiles go for the kid because it's easy, right? The thief steals from the little old lady because she can't fight back. It's not because she deserves it or is richer than a strong group of guys walking down the street. They just say, yeah, I don't want to. Thieves are cowards, right? I don't want to have to work to get the money. This old lady, she can't fight back. That's reptilian, right? And we all have a reptilian brain, right? But that, you know, that was a, a fifth reason to bring an awareness, right? Because one of the things that these videos still do for high, you know, as long as it's in this defense mechanism, is it's got a question from now on when they tell the next sexual abuse survivor, this has never happened again. And that person sees all these videos. They're not going to buy it indefinitely, right? And so when, you know, when people reach out to me, etc., that, that, that's a big discouragement to the reptilian brain of the sociopathic element within the facilitator body and the community, right? Oh, there could be a long-term YouTube record, a long-term web page record of our criminal activity. Uh, be nice to just skip under the law and make it easy and do what we want to do and say this is good behavior, but uh, I don't think we can risk it, right? And so the only way to get reptiles to go to a higher standard is fear, unfortunately. And it's not like the facilitators are all fear-based. No, that may be a strong deciding vote, but you know it also supports the good parts. Right. So my sense was that the facilitators wanted things to go well, but not enough to learn how to do it or admit or had enough character to take responsibility when they failed. Right. So they wanted things to go well, but they didn't sometimes. And when they didn't, they wanted the pain and stuff to go away. They wanted their fear and anxiety to go away more than they wanted to figure out how to do the right thing. And so their fear would overwhelm their ethics. And so by giving them a little fear on the other side, it seems like it might support them in doing the right thing. By the way, I will turn you in if you do that again. And I know you're not setting out to ruin people's lives, but it might help to do the right thing a little bit more if you know that there are consequences, right? And so that's, you know, a, a, another reason for still having this in the understanding that high has not grown up yet at this point. Um, and, you know, the same scapegoating phenomena with the individual that is so absurd is also going on around groups. It's not high that hasn't grown up. It's you and I. It's our cult. It's our culture. It's our family. It's our species. We have not grown up yet. We're still reptilian. We're still sociopathic. We're still emotionally illiterate. We're still shame-based. 
We're still fear and pain based. We're still traumatically illiterate. And we're still desperately trying not to become the scapegoat. And so we sell out other people because we haven't had the competency to create a cult capable of dealing with this, right? And so, you know, of course, high is criminal. Of course, it can, you know, be vastly, you know, improved. But so can you and I, right? So can the US government. So can the Catholic Church. So can the other schools about sexuality. So can Scientology, right? So can your family. So can my family, right? And so, you know, it's, you know, that's, um, that's a bit of perspective that has come with time as I've studied other abuse sagas in Scientology or in Nixium or, you know, in, you know, any, any other number of, you know, ab abuse scandals of this nature. High didn't invent the playbook and is what I'm getting at. And neither did you, right? This is a copied playbook where we all spend as little energy as possible uh, responding to the things that we don't know much about. And so it would take a lot of work to actually figure out what we don't know that we don't know, and then how to know something about it and then try it, you know, try it out. And then we're surrounded by people that don't want to cooperate in that. So if we become competent, right, the, the next door neighbor, they don't want to become competent. So, you, you know, it, it, the, there is currently a punishment mechanism for people that point out the level of cruelty and sociopathic elements in our cult and that we're all able to respond to that. And most of us are not doing as much as we can. Well, that also becomes then a sixth kind of reason to endure and to learn, which is how does a human being, how do I become more able to respond in such a way that creates more well-being overall than not? I'm still learning that, by the way, but it's a little bit hypocritical for me to stay in the child pose of you did this to me and you didn't do it enough and you didn't do that and you didn't do that. And it's all true, right? Every one of you has failed me at some level. It's all true, right? You weren't there when I needed you. You're not reaching out right now saying, how can I help? What can I do, right? If I tell you, you don't want to do it, right? You're all failing me, absolutely, right? My parents, my teachers, my therapists, absolutely. But I'm also failing me, right? I'm failing to find the people that partner with me to create a better world. I'm failing to create those people for myself. They're out there. I'm just failing to create them. And I've also failed to be that person, right? So if you're not that person and I'm mad at you because you, you, you're not that person, well, I'm not that person either. So why don't I look at that? And if I figure out how to be responsible, how to be more intelligent, how to be more loving, well, that becomes then another reason to live through all this pain, to figure out how to be the person I'm mad so many people have not been for me, right? And so that's, you know, so that's moving. And, and that also then leads then to, well, if I figure that out rather than dying, right? Then how do people navigate to that place, right? Because there's this huge, in an incompetent culture, there's not enough time. If there was competency, there'd be plenty of time, right? Because if you meet every human being's needs efficiently with the infinite amount of energy that's all around us, you have lots of time left over if you do it efficiently. But if you're so incompetent that with everyone working their butts off, the majority of people do not even meet the first three human needs, 
to survive, to be secure in that survival, and to experience a high degree of love and belonging. And there are four more needs to go. When we're not even at level three for the majority of human beings and everyone's working their butts off, it's a symptom of profound stupidity, of profound ignorance, of a poor map, right? If you're following a map and getting nowhere for a long period of time, the map is broken. And so one of the awarenesses that I have is that if I manage to get my stuff together and actually maybe at some point before I die, heal the 40% disability I'm carrying since these events with high, or the additional 60% disabilities I'm carrying from childhood trauma and abuse, right? So there's, there's a me that easily has twice as much energy and is three times as effective, and that has a life worth living. I just haven't figured out how to become that person. But let's say that I do figure that out in 10 years, in 20 years. Well, the videos that I make along the way are my record of all the dead ends I hit, and here's, how I, here's what worked, right? And I have been getting steadily healthier over the years and learning what works. And I intend to continue doing that. So as I do that, I grow up a little bit. As I grow up, I blame less. And I respond more. That's the d distinction between the adolescent and the adult. Right? The child accepts it all unconditionally and it's all my fault if people abuse me. The adolescent blames everyone else. It's all their fault. The adult loves the self and then from that experience learns to love others, forgives the self and learns to forgive others, right? So that is a crisis. Right? In an emotionally, in a psychologically illiterate culture, we do not have a lot of adults. We have a lot of children. We have some adolescents, we have a lot of adolescents. We have a relatively small number of adults, not grown-ups. The body will grow you up, but people that know how to love what is and contribute and innovate and evolve. It's a very small percentage, right? And so, you know, I'm also learning how to become an adult, how to be an adult. And again, how do I get there? How does someone else get there? Well, I've made thousands of videos on a whole variety of themes and channels, etc., exploring this process in one degree or another. With the goal, again, answering my frustration and my criticism of the world, why have there been no mentors telling you me half of this stuff? Why? Well, you know, I just wrote a book. It's not in here, it seems. But I just wrote a book, uh, An Introduction to Life. That's an answer to that question. Right? Since I've now read 600 books and done a whole variety of you know, decades worth of experience in different things, I can now share you know, a few hundred things that no one clearly taught me all in one place, right? An introduction to life. I would have liked that introduction. So that's moving into the adult say, rather than just saying, nobody introduced me properly to relationships, nobody introduced this, I had to wait all this time, I had terrible role models, all true, right? That that's the adolescent blame. 
antip antipathy, sympathy of the child, antipathy of the adolescent, moving to synthesis and generation and synergy as the adult. Right? So, so that's a purpose then, to provide for others the antidote to the greatest pains that have been given to me.